You are listening to the third segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Susan Weed. Susan is an American herbalist and director of the Wise Women's Center located near Woodstock, New York. She is known for her writing and teaching of what she describes as the Wise Women Way of Herbalism. Susan is the author of five books and a contributor to the Ratledge International Encyclopedia of Women's Studies and writes a regular column in Sage Woman and for Awakened Woman Online. You can learn more about Susan by visiting SusanWeed.com. Welcome back to Sky Blue Symposia. Joining us this evening is Susan Weed, and we're going to continue our discussion of the three traditions of healing. And Susan, you're going to discuss the heroic tradition this evening. I am talking to you about the heroic tradition this time. In our uh, first of this four-show series, we talked in general about the three traditions of healing and how most of us grow up in the scientific tradition being measured and fixed, being told that uh, we need drugs to keep us healthy, and how more and more of us, as a matter of fact, uh, I think uh, the figure is up to about 90% of Americans, are at least casting our eye into the horizon of alternative medicine. What could that possibly be? And the heroic tradition is not a name that I made up. It's actually what they called themselves several hundred years ago. The heroic tradition has far more history to it than the so-called traditional or scientific medicine. As a matter of fact, we can find um, writings in the heroic tradition from about a thousand years before the common era. So, easily back at least 3,000 years, we have the heroic tradition and the very strong overall idea of the heroic tradition, which is a dualistic idea, not quite as severe as the scientific black and white, but certainly a sense of this is and that. Disease and death is caused in the heroic tradition by disturbances to the humors. The humors, and this is sometimes called the humoral tradition or the humoral theory, the humors are various substances that move through the body. And these are somewhat imaginary substances. One of them is called blood and one is called mucus and one is called yellow bile and black bile. And they don't necessarily mean exactly those things, although it's tempting to think of them in that way. And it is disturbances to these humors that cause disease and ultimately death. And so those humors must be changed in some way. The earliest thinking and the thinking that continues on in the heroic tradition is that those substances become toxic. In other words, they somehow collect filth. And they therefore must be cleansed. They must, in some instances, literally be removed from the body. Or in other instances, we should simply change what we are doing to bring about something that will cleanse the body. And in the heroic tradition, a very powerful reaction to this kind of change would be called a cleansing crisis. A cleansing crisis is supposedly caused by a great number of toxins coming out of your tissues all at once and making you very, very sick. As we will see as we move more into the heroic tradition, most of what the heroic tradition says um, is not based on anything other than wild imagination. 
and even though it has been around for 3,000 years, we also have to go back and look and see that up until the time of Galen, which again was several thousands of years, um, people did not believe that the heart pumped the blood, and it was standard um, medical understanding that the heart didn't have anything to do with moving the blood around in the body. So the fact that, that a medical idea stays around for thousands of years doesn't make it right. It doesn't necessarily make it wrong, but it certainly does not make it right. So the idea of cleansing the humors led to the use of herbs that would cause people to vomit. This is one way of cleansing the humors is to make the person puke. It also led to the use of the herbs that cause copious bowel movements and very watery and large evacuations from the intestines. And so purging was another way to get the filth out of the body, to get the toxins out of the body. And then, of course, there was poking, which is bloodletting. To this day, the British Medical Journal, which would be in the equivalent status of the American Medical Journal, is called the Lancet in reference to the tool that for hundreds of years British physicians used to bleed people, thereby removing the ill humors from their body. Oriental medicine has a similar idea with evil winds, but does not poke, puke, and purge to remove the evil winds, although bloodletting was the precursor to acupuncture in China. The heroic tradition is a powerful tradition, and it is one that has been around for an extremely long time. You may have read of the story of George Washington's death. Yes, the so-called father of our country, the first president of the United States of America, got, we're not quite sure what it was, maybe cold, maybe a flu. Back then it was called the ague. It means, oh, you know, fever, achiness, shivers, oh, not good. And the best physicians of the day were called to George Washington's side, and they said, oh, his humors are grossly disturbed, and they gave him both a purgative and a pucative, so that he both vomited and evacuated, oh, so copiously, and in the morning he was no better, and so they bled him, leaving him weak and suggesting that he not eat, because fasting, of course, is cleanlier than eating food. And that evening, his pulse was very weak and feeble. He was doing much worse than he had been, so they bled him again, and they puked him again, and they purged him again, and can you believe it? The man had the nerve to die that night. Now, you might think I'm telling you a story or that I'm making this up, but really, I'm not. This is the heroic tradition. This was the best medical care just a couple hundred years ago. And you would think, oh my goodness, people have gotten over that, haven't they? No, they have not. The heroic tradition is alive and well, and it is called alternative medicine. Walk into any store that sells healthy food and supplements and you will find the cleanse of this and the cleanse of that and toxin removing that and toxin removing the other thing. One of the first people in the heroic tradition that I met was a very tall, very skinny man by the name of Victor Kolvinskis. And Victor had just written a book called Survival into the 21st Century, being so many years into the 21st century, the title seems a little silly to us, but remember that this was nearly 50 years ago when Victor was doing this. And Victor told me that really clean women don't menstruate and don't ever go through menopause. I found that a rather startling attitude, but science actually does back him up, although not in the way that he envisioned. We find that women who go on restricted diets, 
women who fast a lot, women who take up raw food diets or vegan diets, and even some women who take up vegetarian diets are much more likely than other women to lose their period. In fact, 50% of women on raw food or vegan diets become infertile within the first 12 months of eating such a diet. So Victor was right. They don't menstruate anymore because they are no longer capable of supporting and sustaining and creating new life. Worse yet, when these women come to their senses and begin eating in a responsible and respectful way, to their own bodies way again half of them will never regain their fertility they have done in fact permanent damage to themselves and thus I guess we would have a woman who wouldn't go through menopause a normal healthy change for a woman do you understand how it came to me then that it's possible that the heroic tradition is woman-hating. I began to see this and to experience this and to notice this more and more as I read in the heroic tradition, as I listened to people talk to me in the heroic tradition. I began to see the great distrust of woman, of life, and of the processes that bring about life. The slippery, slidey, bloody, milky, mucousy processes of life and women's bodies that are here that the heroic tradition goes, yuck. I was invited to dinner at the home of one of New Zealand's most famous heroic healers. I'm a pretty good judge of children's ages, and there were quite a few children there, and I was astonished to discover when I actually uh, matched my guesses to their actual ages that I had, uh, in general, I thought the children were half of their actual ages. In other words, I thought that the 18-month-year-old was only 9 or 10 months old. I thought that the 4-year-old was merely 2 because they were small in statue and they were small in intelligence. What I heard from those children the entire time that I was there was, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, and the answer was, go into the garden and eat things from the garden. And finally... And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, each child was offered one half of a raw walnut. I was not surprised then when it got to dinner, and dinner was a very large bowl of, you guessed it, salad. I was there with my sweetheart, and I saw his eyes roaming around the table, looking rather frantically for some salad dressing for his salad. And I saw his eyes light upon a bottle that was near to me. I had already explored that bottle, and I knew that what was in it was a vile substance called rejuvelac, which is supposedly fermented sunflower seeds, but usually it rots. And so I stayed his hand, looked in his eyes, as couples often will, and gave him the oh, uh-uh, you don't want it without hopefully alerting the other people at the table. And so he said, is there any uh, uh, salt? The heroic healer, the head of the household, drew himself up and said, we do without such substances in this household. His wife, being a woman and eager to please, jumped up and said, I think there might be some tamari left in the kitchen. While she was gone looking for the tamari, he saw fit to lecture us that no one should 
think of passing gas or burping in his house. Such things were completely forbidden. And she came back with a bottle with a tiny bit of tamari in it, maybe ten drops. And my sweetheart picked it up and put it on his salad and put it back on the table. And the bottle was nearly broken. So many hands reached for and wanted that tamari. There was a very small bowl. One would think it would be a bowl for an individual person of mashed tofu on the table, and no, that was to serve eight animals. And while they were finishing their dinner, I wandered into the library of my host, and from book after book in his library, I found quotes such as these. Food is the earliest addiction, starting with the newborn's first mouthful. The fall from God consciousness came from eating the forbidden fruit. Under eating is the most important factor for health. Overeating always poisons. You must select and prepare foods properly and eat them properly as well. Periodic fasting keeps the body, the temple of the spirit, clean and pure. You must be taught the correct way of eating and living so that you can avoid ever being in most human beings, the digestive tract is filthy. The purpose of a cleanse is to eliminate mucus and toxins from the body. The mind must be controlled, trained, and directed. Real things are of the spirit. Daily life is but impermanent and continually changing, and thus it is unworthy of When the stomach is working, the vital force goes into digestion, not into spirit. If human beings consumed only radiation, and if radiation were never polluted, and if the procreative function remained entirely dormant, then, and only then, would sickness be unknown among humans. And if you follow this program, it will enable one to get away from the gross and intoxicating nature of having to eat food. <clears throat> Menstruation has its origin in the inflammatory condition of the uterine mucous membrane due to toxic conditions in the intestines. The toxicity of menstrual blood has been well substantiated. The blood, plasma, milk, sweat, and saliva of menstruating women contain a substance that is highly toxic to the protoplasm of living plants. The menstruation itself is unnatural and pathological. If the female body is made perfectly clean, then menstruation and its filth will cease. If a woman stops her monthly loss at an early enough age, her reproductive capacity will persist into centuries. In the healthy woman, menopause occurs, if it occurs at all, very late in life. Unless you change your lifestyle now, you may anticipate the God's vengeance on you. The most aggressive health care available today is available here now. Fasting, frequent enemas, the combining of herbs to make effective remedies, and a strictly controlled diet. Have you heard that there is something wrong with milk? Let me put it to you simply. Fear of milk and hatred of milk is fear and hatred of the mother. Food is not the first addiction learned at the mother's breast. Food is the first love given from the mother's breast, and the rejection of milk is the rejection of the mother. I have said it before, and it bears repeating the heroic tradition. Hates women. Hates mothers. Hates life and its fluids. 
it believes, yes, in body, mind, and spirit, but spirit is pure and high and holy, and the body is filthy and disgusting. And pity the poor mind, caught in between, dragged down into the mess of the body, yet yearning to fly free to the spirit. Is this any way to think about our bodies? Is this any way to be healthy? It always amazes me that this line of thinking can and has persisted for thousands of years. How uncompassionate of ourselves. And yet I understand for woman hating has gone on on this planet for thousands of years. It is the rise of woman loving in our current century that bodes so well for our future, our future in healthcare, and our future as a species. For so long as we reject mother's milk, we are rejecting our own humanness. Milk is the first food, milk is the last food, and milk is the best food any day in between. You know, I was very curious about this idea that there was stuff stuck on the intestines and that stuff stuck on the intestines was putrefying, rotting, and making disgusting mess inside people that was giving off these foul poisons that was causing them to be sick. I mean, this is the basic tenet of the heroic tradition writ large here. And so, again, being kind of curious and blatant and upfront person, I decided to go to a source, and I began to interview surgeons and surgical nurses who have been present at the opening of not just the human abdomen, but the actual intestines, and I asked them if they ever saw anything stuck anywhere on the small or the large intestine of the human body. Now, the vast majority of them laughed in my face. Those who didn't laugh in my face laughed behind their hands, and they said, where did you ever get such a crazy idea? It is impossible for anything to stick in the intestine. Really, I said, how can that be? And they said, well, your digestive tube, which starts in your mouth and ends in your rectum, is completely lined with mucus cells. Yes, I said, I've noticed the inside of my mouth is soft and moist at all times, and if it gets dry, it's bothersome to me, and I want to moisten it. Right, they say, that's those mucus cells. They like to be moist. And those mucus cells are replaced every 24 hours. So even if you were to, like, paint something on the inside of your cheek, you would find that unless it penetrated through the mucus cells, it would be gone within 24 hours. Think about when you have, you know, one of those days where you bite the inside of your cheek. And I mean bite it, chomp, and it's bleeding. And think about how quickly that heals. If you bit your arm, ah, with your teeth like that, it would take. A week or more for it to heal, whereas in your mouth, when you bite your cheek, it can be healed in 36 to 48 hours because cellular turnover is very fast, though. Those mucus-producing cells are replaced every single day, and therefore nothing could ever possibly be stuck on the intestines. Well, I didn't want to take no for an answer, and so I kept asking, and in fact, over a 10-year period, I asked over 5,000 people who've been present at the actual opening of the human intestines, whether they had ever seen anything stuck in the human colon, and they said they hadn't. So we can believe some pretty spurious photographs. Tell you what I'll do. Huh? I'm going to take some iron supplement, and I'm going to mix it with some slippery elm and some psyllium husks. I'm going to put it in a capsule. And I'm going to suggest that you take it as part of a cleanse. Now, the psyllium husk and the slippery elm form a kind of glutinous, rubbery mass. And the iron supplement turns this mass, as well as all of the feces, black. And then I will give you a colonic, which is a very, very deep enema. And I will flush this glutinous black mass which was caused by the capsule that I gave you out of your intestines and show it to you and try to convince you that that was stuck 
in your intestines. No, it simply isn't true. As I have said at the beginning part of this show, and again, it truly does bear repeating, the heroic tradition is based on a lot of misinformation and ideas that, while they have been around for a very long time, are deeply erroneous. The idea of no pain, no gain comes to us right from the heroic tradition. The wise woman tradition turns this rather on its head and says, no pleasure, no treasure. You know, one of the things that is actually rather soothing in the scientific tradition of healthcare is the scientific tradition says, oh, well, you know, this happened to you. You're not to blame. Don't worry about it. We'll fix it. Whereas in the heroic tradition, oh, my goodness, we really are to blame. I said that the primary emotion of the scientific tradition is fear. You better get that numb game. What if you have breast cancer? You better do this. Take this drug. What if your cholesterol is too high and you have a heart attack? Fear, fear, fear. I rarely find myself making really good decisions based on fear. Well, the heroic tradition instead of fear gives us blame and shame and guilt. Ooh, is that really better? Well, you know. One day, I said to my mentor, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, I said, Elizabeth, I don't get, we have had all these people in here, and they've been talking about all these bad things that happened, and blaming themselves, and Elizabeth, they're to blame, right? With this one woman, and she went out to the beach with her husband and her three kids, and they had this little inflatable raft, and after they had a picnic, the Dad and the kids said, let's go on the raft, and Mom said, I don't want to go on the raft, I'm just going to lay here and read my book, and the Mom did, and dad and kids went out on the raft, and this freak wave took them and drowned them. And she's acting like she's responsible. She didn't do anything. And, and the woman who wanted cream in her coffee, and her husband went to get up to get the cream, and a brick fell off the building and hit him on the head and killed him. She's not responsible. What if the cream didn't kill her husband? And say, Elizabeth, could you please explain to me why these people want to blame themselves for this thing? And Elizabeth looked at me. She had such a compassionate look at times, and she said, dear, don't you understand that it's better to blame yourself than to see clearly that we live in a chaotic universe? If you believe in blame and shame, she went on, then you believe in control. And you think that what you can do can control things. And thus, you take on the burden of the blame and the shame. You take on, as it were, the punishment for your sins in the hopes that you can make things different. This, of course, was one of the stages of death and dying that Elizabeth had noticed was the bargaining the bargaining stage, if you let my sweetheart live, I will do this. And the other side of bargaining is blame and shame. If only I hadn't, then this wouldn't have. The heroic tradition gives us blame and shame, and we accept it because we erroneously believe that there is some power hidden in the blame and the shame. I am here to tell you that with my decades of experience, I have never yet seen anyone truly reach a state of satisfied well-being, starting from I'm to blame. Starting from I'm wrong. Starting from I did it wrong. Starting from I have to limit. Limits bring us closer and closer into the circle. Shall we close our eyes again? If you're not driving, oh, there's that golden line that you drew. Pick up that golden line, one end in your right hand and one end in your left hand, and bring those ends together. Fuse it into a circle. And I'd like you to stand inside that circle. And how do you feel when you stand inside that circle? Do you feel safe? Do you feel protected? Do you feel inside like an insider? Or do you feel locked up? Do you feel imprisoned? Do you feel constricted? Step outside. Even if you feel
feel safe in there. Step outside. Step outside the circle. How do you feel now? Are you the rebel? Are you the outrider? Are you the one who flaunts the rules? Are you scared? Are you frightened? Are you alone? You can go back and forth from inside the circle to outside the circle as many times as you want, and that is often what we do in the heroic tradition. I am not going to eat any sugar at all. And then you fall off, and you're outside the circle, and wow, that freedom is intoxicating, and then you blame and shame yourself and beat yourself into submission and go back inside the circle. The heroic tradition may be seen as an alternation between desperately trying to follow the ever stricter rules and the glorious freedom of not doing so, and then followed by the shame, blame, and guilt that we engender from not following the rules, and yet again, the attempt to follow those rules. The heroic tradition is alive and well, especially in herbal medicine. The herbs that poke and puke and purge are lobelia, lobelia inflata, a wild lobelia related to the one that you grow in pots. And it is often known as puke weed. Hmm, there's our puking for sure. Golden seal, golden seal, a perennial plant of the northeast of North America, was primarily used by the native people as a dye, yellow pacoon was its primary name. It makes a very fast and quite beautiful yellow dye. I asked for years and years and years from native people what it was used for medicinally, and they wouldn't tell me, and they kept saying nothing. It wasn't used. No, no. I knew it was used, and there were all these books that were saying it was used this way and that way, and so I was very confused as to why they wouldn't admit uh, what I was reading in the books, and finally, an elder woman took me aside, and she said, do you really want to know how we used golden seal? And I said, yes. Wasn't it used for liver problems? She said, no, dear. It was used to destroy the liver, you see. You've probably heard that we liked to torture people, and it's true. When we had a fight with someone and we captured people, we would torture them. And the men tortured the men, and the women tortured the women. Now, the men, of course, are much gorier than the women. We didn't like to do mm, gory things, but as you know, women can be meaner than men. And so what we would do if we had a woman we could torture is we would fast her for a few days, and then we'd feed her golden seal root. And she'd be so hungry that she would eat it, even though she knew that it could cause liver failure, kidney failure, or perforation of the intestines, each of which gives way to a long, lingering, painful, and quite gruesome death. Women can indeed be meaner. So we have a pukeweed, and we have a weed that can poke holes full of you, and the third of our triumvirate is cayenne pepper, lobelia, golden seal, and cayenne. You will find one or more of these in virtually every heroic herbal formulation. Cayenne, you're thinking cayenne like I eat in my food, cayenne. Yeah, cayenne, which what does it do to you? It causes purging, doesn't it? Yes, indeed. It causes more frequent bowel movements. It moves through the system very rapidly. It inflames and irritates that mucus lining. It destroys taste buds, causing one to crave ever more of it. It is truly an addictive substance, as are all peppers. But the heroic tradition favors herbs that are very near to drugs, favors herbs that are loaded with alkaloids and poisons, favors herbs that have strong, powerful actions so that people can say, yo, something must have really happened when I took that herb. Of these three herbs, I do not use cayenne at all, even in cooking. I have used golden seal once in over 40 years of working with herbs, and that was externally for someone who was in a car accident and a large area of her skin was flayed off of her body as the car rolled. The third one, Lobelia in Flata, grows wild in my woods, and I find it a very handy psychoactive for opening the gates 
it's a fairy land. Perhaps you'll come and join me sometime when we go out on a walk here at the Wise Woman Center, and I can introduce you to Lobelia in Flata and teach you how to use her in order to get in touch with the fairies. No, you won't have to puke at all. Different ways of preparing herbs give us very different results. The scientific tradition, which is linear, which measures and which fixes. The heroic tradition, which is circular, runs on blame and shame, cleanses the toxins out of the filthy temple and restricts our lives. And the wise woman tradition, which nourishes the wholeness of the individual person. Thank you for joining me on a trip through the three traditions of healing. Go back and listen to the previous shows if you didn't hear the introductory show or the one on the scientific tradition, and come back and join us next week when I'll be talking about the wise woman tradition. Green blessings, and remember, herbal medicine is people's medicine. Thank you, Susan. This completes the third segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. 